Uh, they had very limited file sizes that they could support. The file system, which was the FAT file system, we'll look at in a little bit, um, it only supported file names that were eight characters long with a three character extension. There were no multi megabyte files at the, at the beginning. For the record, though, when I first got my 81 IBM PC, the very first IBM personal computer that ever came to be, I had no hard drive. They didn't ship with one. You didn't need one. And I know you're confused, but it's, way, it's, it's the same thing you do with like a Nintendo. Or maybe not like a Switch, but like an old Nintendo, like a Super Nintendo. You, the games are self-booting. Well, so is this, that was true for the old IBMs as well. All right. So aside from having limited memory support, aside from having limited file system support, uh, it could do some very basic shell scripting, but that was about it. So it could load programs, it could do basic shell scripts, a little bit of file system navigation, but that's really all that it could do. And it did it all with internal privilege, which is kind of funny. Um, now, what's interesting about DOS is there is an entire branch of Microsoft Windows that is actually DOS based. So everything up to and including Windows ME, but not the NT series, is all DOS based. It is just an extension to the DOS operating system. And at a later date, Microsoft added things like virtual memory, kernel privileges, and so on. But at the beginning, it had nothing. Now, what's interesting is compare this, what we've just given to consumers, to what commercial uh, installations had. If you were a company, you had Unix, or BSD, or OpenVMS, and through that operating system, you had time sharing, concurrency, you had networking, security rings, you had everything. And they gave users nothing. Now you might be wondering, well, why did users not say anything? Because users didn't know what the hell a computer was for in 1981. When I first got a computer, it was like, ooh, shiny. What am I supposed to do with this? Oh, cool game. Oh, look, we're perfect. I can like type something up. It, it didn't, it wasn't something that people went home at the end of the day and sat there and just, you know, surfed the internet on. Technically speaking, I did have a modem that operated at 9600 baud, but you couldn't really talk to anybody on it. So at that time, it was okay. It, it was okay. Consumers didn't need to run two programs at the same time because they never thought they could run two programs at the same time. Now, sometime later, IBM did finish their operating system, CPM, and they tried to release it, and it failed because it cost several hundred dollars more than DOS, and everybody was already used to DOS. It was cheap and easy. Why would we pay all this money for something we don't really feel like we need? So, CPM. All right. By the way, some of the best computer games out there are DOS-based, and uh, what's really great is because DOS is like so deprecated and so ancient, there are all of these abandonware websites online where you can go and download all these awesome DOS games, like Castle Adventure, one of the first games I ever played, and then there's games like Jazz and Jackrabbit that I used to play in the library when I was in elementary school. All of these things are DOS based and you can download like a DOS emulator and play them on your computer. Uh, you need the emulator. Uh, DOS box is a great one. Uh, fun times. Maybe wait until you know you study for your exams though before you get into that. Uh, all right. So it is time to move on to a new section. Because we have finished virtual memory. Woo, yay. And uh, the new section we're moving on to today is scheduling. And this is something that we've completely glossed over for the last two months. We say, you know, oh, a thread goes next. And just trust me, a thread will get selected. We've never actually described how a thread gets chosen to go next on a context switch or why you may choose one thread over another thread to go next on a context switch. So now it's actually time to go back and look at scheduling, which is how do we choose which thread gets to go next. But we're going to approach this not from a thread perspective, 
we're going to go back to the 1950s and start there and then build our knowledge from up from that. So if we're looking at the 1950s, we don't know what a threat is. And instead, we call the work that we need to do jobs. So we've got some number of jobs in our system. And I need some way of choosing which job gets to go next. Now, with each of the jobs that I have, I know two pieces of information. One of the pieces of information that I know is when the job arrives at the computer. I also know how long the job is. Very reasonable, right? Now, once I know I have some jobs, I know when they arrive, and I know how long they're going to run for, there are two things that I can calculate. I can calculate the response time, which is the time between when the job arrives and the job starts to run. You can think of the response time as how much delay between when I initiate the job and it actually starts to go. How long do I have to wait till this work actually starts going? Then we have the turnaround time, which is the time between when the job is created and when the job actually finishes. That is, what is the total amount of time I anticipate to wait before this thing is done? All kinds of delays to consider. And when we are trying to create a scheduling algorithm, we are generally trying to minimize one of those two things. We either want to minimize on average our response time or on average minimize our turnaround time. Now, and there are lots and lots and lots of different scheduling algorithms out there. And the simplest scheduling algorithm you'll see is called first come, first serve. And this is, should be fairly straightforward. It's a lineup. And when the job arrives, it goes to the back of the line. And then when we need a new job, we take the one at the front of the line. It's a neat and orderly line, i.e. not Costco on the weekend. All right. So for these slides, we have a few example jobs. Uh, they are J1, J2, J3, and J4. And at time zero, J1, 2, and 3 are already there and waiting. And we're going to assume that they arrived, you know, just a hair between each other, so that they're in the queue of waiting for jobs in the order 1, 2, 3. And then job 4 is going to arrive at time 5. So we have this thing called a Gantt chart that we can use to show you which job is running at each period of time. So first come, first serve, we go to our ready pool and we say, oh, job one is the first one in the line. And so we take it. And job one is going to run for five units of time, so it gets the CPU for the entire five units of time. And when it is done, it leaves the system because it's over. And then we are ready to choose a new job. Now it just so happens that at time five, another job arrives. And that job is job four. And it goes to the back of the line. There are other jobs in front of it, so it has no impact on who gets selected next. The next one in the list is job two, so we choose job two. And it runs for eight units. When it finishes at time 13, we look at who exists and we see there's job three. Well, we take job three and it runs for three units. And then finally at time 16, we take finally job four. <coughs> wow, that was easy, right? You can implement that in probably five minutes if OS 161 didn't already do for you. So here's the problem. While this is perfectly fair, while this guarantees that every job will run, it didn't give our users the illusion that multiple jobs were running at the same time. It didn't make great utilization of our CPU's resources. We can do better. All right. So let's look at another option. We want to give our users then the illusion that multiple things are actually executing at the same time. And as you know from the very first 
part of this course in order to give users the illusion of multiple things running at the same time, we're going to rapidly switch between them. So we are going to set a scheduling quantum of two units, and then if we implement the round robin scheduler using first come, first served with preemption. And here is how it works. We always, when a new job arrives, goes to the back of the line. We always take from the front of the line. Now, if you are running and you get preempted because your quantum has expired, go to the back of the line and wait your turn. And then we take the next job. It gets its two units. And then when it's done, it goes to the back of the line until each job has completed. Now, to walk you through how this chart goes, I'm actually going to draw this out on the board here. Thank <laughs> you. 
Job two is going to get preempted, and now <laughs> that should be um, yeah. I've got it done. That's pretty. Sorry about that. We don't have two job ones. That doesn't make any sense. All right. So uh, job four, job three. Job one, and now job two, which has four left. So I end up finally choosing job four. Now what's nice about job four is it doesn't get preempted, it terminates. So at job twelve, at time twelve, we're down the job. And now we have job three, we have job one, and we have job two. We end up choosing job three because it's at the front. And then after choosing that one, we're like, hey, wait a minute. It finishes before the quantum expires, so what happens? Well, the quantum restarts. This is something to remember about scheduling and preemption. Every time a thread is, or job is selected to run, the quantum resets itself. So we're resetting our stuff at a time 13 now, because at 13 there's nothing running. I now have the following. And I end up taking job one. <coughs> and that finishes at time 14, which leaves me with just job two. And then, of course, we still get preempted at time 16. But at time 16, when we get interrupted, we realize there's no other jobs to choose from. So our only choice is to keep running. And so that job is going to keep running to the end. So this is round robin scheduling, and this is OS161's scheduling algorithm. It's actually really easy to implement, right? It's just a queue, put things in the back, take from the front. Nothing, nothing terribly complicated. What's really nice is we are fairly sharing the CPU between all of the available jobs. It gives the illusion to the user that, hey, look, all these things are running at the same time, even though they are not. And one very important thing doesn't happen. There is no job that will starve. That is, there's no jobs that will sit here waiting for the CPU and never get it. You will always get your fair shot at the CPU. All right. Any, Any questions, questions about this one? All right. Wow, well, then. Let's, Let's go, go on to, to the next, next one. one. What does SC, FC mean on the previous slide? SC, SC? That's a spelling mistake. <laughs> Didn't you know I can't spell? Uh, uh, just like one clarification. So on time 14, you have a uh, uh, job to do, right? Yes. Um, but so it has four seconds left, and you can put a two more time minutes on it. So at time 16, does it get kicked out? Ready to and then it back in. That comes down to operating system implementation. If you look at something like OS 161, thread switch in the scheduler is reasonably intelligent. It will say, hey, there's no other options, and it won't go all the way through to pushing it out to ready to and pop it back. That comes down to implementation. Yeah. All right. Now, what are the downsides of the first come, first served and round robin scheduling is it didn't try to minimize anything. We weren't trying to minimize the, um, the turnaround time. We weren't trying to minimize the response time. Uh, it's just something that's really easy to implement and we know it's fair and everybody will get a chance at the CPU. So now I want to look at an algorithm called shortest job first. What's interesting about shortest job first is that it does, on average, have a minimal, or at least a lower, turnaround time. That's great. No, it's not so great. Because this algorithm also has a big problem. Here's how it works. Instead of having a queue of jobs, we now just have a pool of jobs. And every time I want to select a new job, I don't choose the one in front of the pool. I choose the shortest one. 
So of job one, two, and three that would exist in the pool at time zero, I'm going to choose job three to go first because it is shortest. And then I would choose job one, and then I am choosing job four, and then finally job two. What you are doing here is you show up to the grocery store and ramen noodles were on sale, you know that shin ramen stuff, the spicy one. And uh, you show, you've got four carts of it. And, and a grandma shows up behind you and she's got a bag of milk. Courtesy dictates you let her go first. Except here's the problem with Short's job first. There's a never ending stream of grandparents showing up with one bag of milk, which courtesy dictates you let go in front of you, and so you starve to death in the grocery store checkout with four carts of ramen noodles. That is exactly what's going to happen here. We end up with starvation. Not such a good idea. Well, can we change it up? We had no preemption here. Can I maybe add some preemption and make this work a little better? Well, they call that shortest remaining time first. Now, how shortest remaining time works is not that you get preempted every n time units. It's simply that when a new job arrives, that new job has the option to preempt the running one and force you to choose again which job has the shortest amount of remaining time. So let's actually go through this one here on excuse me, word as well. Alright. We can't call it a Q anymore.
If you don't know how long you're going to sit down and do something for, how could we possibly have the computer know how long it's going to run for? So algorithms that are relying on the runtime, not really practical to implement. Now, there was a period of time where we could roughly estimate it for a particular machine, but can we? Can we even do that? Let's write a piece of code. So, best way to show this, let me find a nice terminal here. There we go. Um, all right. Yes, I know I'm using C++. Sue me. All right, let's, let's make, make it do some, some work. work. I'm being lazy, okay? We need to build some loops in here to show you what I want to show you. So I'm going to build another loop. Helps if I write the code properly, of course. So let's do a plus equals x, and we'll return a. All right, that's fairly simple. Did I? Thank you. That would help. <laughs> I don't usually sit here and write code on the fly, all right? I usually have a program that I use for this, but I don't know where it is right now. All right, G++. Ugh. <laughs> That's knack. Sometimes it makes me mad. There we go. That's the problem with Mac, right? If you install G, if you try to use GCC straight up, and you're like, oh, I'm using GCC. If you actually type GCC dash dash version, it'll tell you, oh, actually, I'm LLVM. It's so annoying. All right, let's run this. All right, seems to run pretty quickly, but how run fast does it actually run? There's a magical command that you can actually use called time. And this is going to tell you how long this job takes to run. Now, this is something where technically speaking, I could, using the time command, see how long it takes to run and use that in my scheduling algorithm. Or can I? So let's run it once. There we go. Oh, that's kind of a boring program. Uh, all right. So there we go. And let's run it again. Oh, it's not a big enough program. Let's make it harder. If it's too small, you go below uh, the threshold. Let's make this 100,000. I think it's optimizing it out. You're turning zero. So just Flags aren't default. I don't have those default. Should be fine. <laughs> Optimizations aren't always default. That's a little better. There we go. So there we go. Now I actually have some, some real, turn some light thought there. Of course, it's the center one that gives the problem. All right, so I've run it once. Let's run it again. Whoa. Did you see that? So it's not even that we, the user, don't know how long we're going to run our programs for. Everything
every single time you run the program on the computer, you can get a phenomenally different result. Why do we get different results? Well, we get a different result because the state of the computer, according to me, may not have changed, but the state of the computer, according to the operating system, may have changed. There may be input coming in from a network card that's being processed in the background, causing us to spend more time executing kernel code than executing my program's code. So every single time I run the same program on the same computer, I actually end up with a different time. Now what's interesting is if I take the same program and I run it on a different computer, it's going to give me different times still. Because the amount of time it takes for a program to run is not just about you know, the CS240 style, let's analyze this code and give some big O notation. It's also, you know, it runs on a certain performance of a machine that's going to impact how long that code runs for. Having scheduling algorithms whose basis is how long does a program run for does not make sense. From a theoretical perspective, sure, but from a practical perspective, this does not make sense. And by the way, if you look at a lot of operating systems and systems research in general, they love to give you specs of, oh, look how fast this thing is. That part of the paper is outdated before it even gets published half the time. Because they did those specs, those, those measurements, with respect to a very specific computer in a very specific state. And yes, they ran those tests, you know, 100,000 times and produced, you know, some averages and standard deviations. But next week, when there's a brand new CPU out, it's going to be a completely different story. Common thing. All right. Yeah? I have a quick question. Uh, when on Mac it says user and system, is that similar to saying user and kernel? Like, ah, so yeah. Terminology? What you're seeing is real is human time. Uh, user is how much time was spent executing user land code and system is how long was spent uh, doing system code. Or kernel. Not kernel code. Uh, what's interesting is you'll find that user and system don't often add up to real and sometimes they add up to being more. Um, my understanding is that's a rounding thing. But yeah, that's roughly what that is. Uh, and this command, by the way, exists in Linux as well. So it's a really fun one if you want to know how long your program takes. If you're going to use it though, make sure you do a statistically significant number of samples so that you and record what machine you are running it on so that your results actually make sense. Otherwise it's boring. Doesn't make any sense. All right. So as it was pointed out. We don't actually know how long things are going to run for, and if we don't know how things are going to run for, then it would be very difficult for us to build a scheduling algorithm that is based on how long does this job actually take to run. And if you want to know the classic example that I usually use for this is when I was in grade eight, we wanted to learn how to write programs. And so we cracked open the Commodore 64, and uh, we wrote a basic program. The first program I ever wrote was to print the numbers from one to a million on the screen. It took 12 and a half hours. 12 and a half hours to print the numbers from one to a million on the screen. I wrote that same program, I think a year ago in C++, and do you know how long it took to run? Like less than two seconds. If that isn't a clear indication that the job runtime is not something you should rely on, I don't know. All right. So if we can't use those things, then how are we actually going to decide uh, which algorithm, an algorithm, to actually schedule our threads? Well, we have to look at things. Are we going to consider every <coughs> single? thread, because now let's call them by what they're actually called as threads, do we consider them all equal? Is my BitTorrent thread running in the background equal to my Unreal Tournament thread I have right now? No, they're not equal. Because one of those things I'm interacting with, and I want it to be super responsive, and I want it to get lots of CPU time, and my BitTorrent thread running in the background, I don't really care, it'll, have, it'll finish when it finishes. 
So these scheduling algorithms that we've shown you so far, in addition to having them require uh, the need for the job runtime, they also aren't considering priority of different threads. Not every thread has the same priority. Something else those algorithms didn't take into consideration is the fact that threads do yield and they block. And how do those scheduling algorithms handle the fact that a thread has yielded or that a thread is blocking? So how we'd like to do this is finally in this course we're going to show you something real instead of how does OS161 do it, right? Um, so we are going to look at how two of the biggest scheduling algorithms out there, now this is, we're looking at a very generic version of it. Understand that the operating systems that use these have their own uh, personalized modifications to these algorithms. So we're going to look at the one that Windows uses, which is called multi-level feedback queues. And it's also used by Mac OS and BSD and pretty much everybody but Linux, and Linux used to use it, but now they use something called uh, the CFS, which I can never remember what it stands for. Uh, and um, we will look at CFS as well. So we'll start with MLFQ. So this is your most common scheduling algorithm out there, and it's been used by pretty much everybody. And uh, the idea is instead of having one ready queue, we're going to have multiple. And we're going to try to give priority uh, to threads that are interactive. And an interactive thread is a thread that is blocking frequently because it is waiting for the user to actually give us some kind of input. So interactive threads run for very short periods of time before they either terminate or they block while they wait for some kind of input. And we want to give them the highest priority in our system so that we are giving our users the best possible experience. So what we're going to do is we have multiple feedback, multiple queues. And each queue has a different scheduling quantum. And because we don't know which threads are going to be interactive, We've built the system in such a way that interactive threads are going to self-identify. And non-interactive threads are also going to self-identify, and they're going to trickle down through the system into the lowest priority queue. So let's take a look at how this actually works. So we have n queues, and uh, qn has the highest priority and it also has the shortest quantum. We are trying to say that high priority threads are those that are interactive, which means they run for very, very short periods of time before blocking or terminating, which means that a very short quantum should be really good for finding them. So highest priority queue, smallest quantum. Each queue below has a <coughs> larger and larger quantum corresponding to lower and lower priority threads. And this is how it works. When we want a new thread, because so we're having a context switch, we're always going to choose a thread from the highest priority queue that has threads available. So if QN has threads, we'll grab one from it. If QN is empty, but there's one in QN minus one, then we grab the one from QN minus one. We only grab the threads from the very bottom if there are no higher priority threads above us. So that's kind of fun. Now, some additional information. If a low priority thread is running, it's going to be running for a very long period of time because the scheduling quantum is actually very long. A low priority thread is one that's not very interactive. It's how it ended up down at the bottom. Now what's going to happen if you are a low priority thread and you're running for a very long period of time? That means you're probably not blocking very often. But what if a high priority thread suddenly arrives? Are we gonna force the high priority thread to wait for that low priority thread to finish? MLFQ implementations for the most part say no. We are going to let uh, it be preempted. So if a lower priority thread is being run and a higher priority thread arrives, we will permit 
preemption and a context switch back to the high priority threat. Now, how do you end up in the low priority queue in the first place? Every thread starts out at the top. Every thread. You run. If you are preempted, you do not go on to the back of the queue you just came off of. If you are preempted, it means that you wanted more CPU time than we figure threads of this priority should have. So we are going to preempt you, kick you off the CPU, and push you onto the back of the next lower priority queue. And then when you run from that queue and you get preempted, you're going to filter your way down until you reach the bottom. That is how we identify the threads which are interactive versus those that are not. Interactive threads are going to be caught, um, going to yield, and they're going to block, whereas the other ones are just going to get preempted. Do you have a question? Uh, I was going to ask, do each queue have a different point? Yes, yes they do. So do each queue have a specific point that's going to do it? So this is one of those things, I know when we talked about preemption before, there is this belief that when you set the timer to do the preemption, you set it for exactly the schedule in quantum. And actually, if you look at how a lot of operating systems do it, what they do instead is they actually set the timer to count down for a smaller interval. And then they'll just check when the timer interrupts and say, hey, has this one expired or not? And if not, it goes back to run. So that's, and that way they don't have to you know, keep changing the clock all the time, because that's a pain as we'll see next week. Yep? What happens if you have down and say you're actually quite other things at the same time? Does the two threads have to run simultaneously at a time? And can you run down to say one thread is a high priority and one is a down to say you're down so, I mean, that's one of the problems that we have. So what would happen is while your interactive thread, like let's say while you're browsing the web, and let's say for some reason that only used a single thread, it doesn't, um, but let's suppose it did, when the web browser is waiting for input from you, it would be blocked, which would give your BitTorrent thread the opportunity to run. When you are blocked, you are not a part of a ready queue. Which brings me to something else that happens with multi-level feedback queues. If you are blocked and somebody wakes you back up, you are put into the highest priority queue. Not the one you came out of, the highest priority. Why? Because we want to respond to conditions being met he is being pressed as quickly as possible. And so the best way to do that is to put waking threads in the highest priority queue. Now, there's a problem with this algorithm. Can anyone identify what the problem is? Starvation. There's a starvation problem. You know how you fix it? It's real easy. Every period of time, what's your thought? Pretty much it's exactly what we're going to do. Every so many units of time, take every thread in the system and put them all back up to the top. So what's going to happen is everybody starts out up here, trickle down, trickle down, trickle down, trickle down, <coughs> pull them back up, trickle down, trickle down, trickle down. Uh, so, so this algorithm is used in Solaris, it's used in Windows and everybody else too, but I have the numbers for Solaris, that's the difference. Um, Solaris used six levels with quantums spanning from 40 milliseconds down to 200 and they pulled every thread back into the highest priority queue once per second, which prevented the starvation. So pretty fair, it's a fairly straightforward algorithm to implement. Now, so this is what our state diagram would actually look like. So we always start out at the highest priority queue. When we run, that's great. If we get preempted, we are going to go down a level. 
And when we run from there, we'll go down a level until, and once we reach the bottom, we're just going to stay down at the bottom. Now, again, to prevent starvation, periodically we take everything and promote it back to the top. If you block, when you wake back up, you dump it up into the highest priority. So we have a little example in here. So this is using uh, a few threads. So we've got two threads and they're both starting out in the high priority queue. So we're going to take thread one and it's going to run. And so it is in the running state and Q3 still has one thread waiting in it. Now, in this slide, what's happened is thread one got preempted. And because it got preempted, it doesn't go back onto Q3. It goes into the next lower priority queue. So it went from running to pre being preempted and going into ready Q2. Now, then we had to select a new thread to run. There were threads still in the highest priority queue, so we chose one from it. So T2 ends up running. Now, T3 arrives. <coughs> so let's see what happens, and T2 is still running. Now, when T3 arrives, it doesn't cause a context switch, because the priority of the thread that is running right now is the same as the priority of the thread that just arrived, and so there's no reason to change. If that was different, let's say that was a, prior, a low priority thread, then we would do a context switch, but it's not, so we're not going to. All right. Now T through terminates, and we have to choose another thread. Well, I can choose T3 from Q3 or T1 from Q2. Well, T3 is the higher priority one, so I'm going to take it. And then it blocks. And when it blocks, there are no more threads in ready Q3. So I go to the next lowest priority queue to find the next highest priority thing. Now T1 finally gets to go. So T1 gets to run. That's fun. And let's say T1 gets preempted. When it gets preempted, it goes down a priority. And then there's nothing else. So it gets to go. Because there's nobody else in the system. And now that it's running, T3 wakes up. And when T3 wakes up, it goes into Q3, and it is going to preempt T1. Because it has a higher priority than the current running thing, and we want to be responsive to that interactive thread, that thread that just woke up, and so we preempt thread one, we put it back into ready Q1, and now we are going to select T3 to actually run. So very quickly, that is how multi-level feedback queues work. Now there are lots of variations on this, by the way. Uh, how do you choose a thread line that you do uh, block everything up to the same level in the thread So each of the queues is a final queue. Okay. Yeah, or well, they're round robin queues actually. Each of them is a round robin. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Always choose the, the first one. Yes, and now we need to what whatever yields and then make another point in the same yeah. So if you yield, we treat yield as preemption because yield would be you not being very interactive. Yield is you voluntarily giving up the CPU, which means you must not be very high priority. So on a yield, we push you down. Alright, any other questions about that? So, that's all there is. <laughs> now, obviously, there's more to it than that. Um, each individual operating system is going to make modifications to it according to whatever scheduling things they want to optimize for. That's just the general idea. 
And now we'd like to look at the general idea behind the Linux CFS scheduler completely fair. This is what uh, Linux actually switched to, I want to say it was five years ago, but I have a feeling it was probably closer to 10 years ago, maybe even 15. Time kind of loses meaning after a while. Uh, all right, so they used to use multi-level feedback queues, and now they use completely fair scheduler. So the idea behind completely fair scheduler is that instead of having different uh, scheduling quantums, every thread, no matter what its priority, has the exact same scheduling quantum. Makes life a little bit easier. Uh, however, how then do we make sure the threads that have higher priority get a more fair share of the CPU time that would be, you know, relevant to their priority? Well, how we do that is each thread gets assigned a weight. And then we are going to dish out CPU time according to your weight. So a high weight thread should get a greater proportion of the CPU's time than a low weight thread. Now, how do we do that? <coughs> So each thread has its own weight, and we know in the system what is the total weight of all the existing threads out there right now. And then for when it is time to select the next thread, what we're going to do is we compute what's known as the virtual run time. What we want to know is roughly what amount of time should we be giving to this one. So the virtual run time is the actual runtime, which is how much time have you actually run on the CPU for, multiplied by the sum of weights. So the numerator here is the sum of all thread weights in the system, and the denominator is your weight. So we're multiplying the actual amount of time you have run by what proportion of the weights you make up, like are you one-tenth of the threads in the system or are you three-fifths of the threads in the system? And that is going to give us our virtual runtime. And we always choose the thread with the lowest virtual runtime. What this ends up happen having is that threads that are low weight will have their virtual runtimes advance much more quickly than threads that are high weights, which means that low weight threads will get a lower percentage of the CPU's time than high weight threads, which will get their appropriate <coughs> larger percentage of the CPU's time. So we have an example in here, and I'll let you guys spend some time to do this. So take a couple minutes, and what I'd like you to do is um, Calculate the virtual runtime for time equal to t. Figure out at time t which thread gets selected. And then give that thread five more units of time and figure out what thread would get chosen at time t plus five. So take a few minutes and see if you can calculate this one for the two. Formulas on the previous page, by the way.
slide, the answer was there too. Better to get the practice, right? All right, so if you look at this, what you need to do for time t is you're given the total thread weight of all the threads in the system as being 50. And of these three threads, we want to know which one of these three will go next. So what you do is you're going to, well as it turns out, those are the only three threads there are. So you're going to take the weight and take the sum of all system weights, so it's 50 divided by your weight, and multiply that by your actual line time. So what you see is that the high weight thread number one ends up with a virtual run time of 10. And then the next weight thread has a virtual run time of 12.5. Whereas the really low weight thread ends up with a virtual runtime of 50. We always choose the thread with the lowest virtual runtime, so we're going to choose thread number one. Now, what that means is that thread number one is now going to get five units of time to run. And so at time t plus five, where we have to choose another thread again, if you look at the actual runtime, we see that thread one's actual runtime has advanced to 10 because it just ran for five more units. So we recalculate its virtual runtime as now instead of five times a half, it's now, or, yeah, five, instead of five times 50 over 25, now we have 10 times 50 over 25, so we end up with 20. And at which point we see that the next thread, number two, should get a chance to run. And again, we don't run the low weight thread because his virtual runtime is the biggest. And you should actually be able to calculate at what point should I expect thread number three to actually get an opportunity to run. So if you're looking for a little experiment to run at home, try to figure out at what time, using the quantum of five, would you finally run thread three in this example. Yeah? What if you dress on the same virtual runtime? Um, yeah, what do you do then? Uh, there's lots of things that you could do. Um, I don't particularly know off the top of my head how Linux chooses which of two threads if they have the exact same runtime. I think the probability that that is the case is pretty probably rare. Um, but if it does, I mean, you could choose, well, which one ran most freak recently? Choose the other one. That's one good strategy. Um, another strategy is, um, uh, which is the newest thread? Choose the newest thread to go. 
because maybe we should be giving uh, more time to a program that's just opening, and maybe that's why it's the newest threat. There's lots of choices that you can make. Now, something else you have to also do with Linux is completely fair scheduler, is how do you handle things like blocking? Um, because if you block for a really long period of time and give everybody else a chance to run, when you become unblocked, you can get a very unfairly large amount of the CPU's time when you return. Or when you're a new thread, you may be a really low priority new thread, but since you've never run before, your virtual runtime would be zero. So it's what usually happens is in these situations, you get assigned a vir an initial virtual runtime that's somewhere in the min and max range of all the other threads so that nobody gets some unfair burst. All right, so those are the only two scheduling algorithms we actually are going to look at because realistically, everything we've talked about with respect to scheduling so far has been making you believe we have only one CPU. I cannot remember the last computer I bought that had a single core CPU. Actually, that's not true. I can remember it. It was an AMD Athlon 800, an 800 megahertz machine. You want to know what's really cool about that CPU? That CPU was on its own board. It wasn't like a chip that plugged into the motherboard. It was a chip plugged into a board, and the board plugged into the motherboard. So the chip came out of the motherboard at a 90 degree angle. That was really cool. <laughs> okay, I'm a dork, right? I like hardware. Really? Well, it was 800 megahertz. What's a cooler again? Old CPUs didn't have coolers. Oh. <laughs> Well, let's see, I mean, they, it had a heat sink, but it didn't have a fan. Yeah. They weren't exactly, they were rather cumbersome things. All right, that, that was the last computer I had that was a single core unit. When I bought my first laptop in 2003, it was a hyper-threaded machine. That means two. That's really old. So how do you actually deal with scheduling when you can actually run more than one thread at the same time. Well, there are two schools of thought for multi-core scheduling. You can do one ready queue per core. That's option A. Option B is to have one ready queue that is shared by all of the cores. Now, I'm going to address this one first. And I know there are two more slides here, but they're text and they're boring. We're just going to talk about what's on those slides with respect to this picture. So let's look at the shared ready queue. Here's the problem. It doesn't look like a problem here. But each, let's suppose that two of those cores need a new thread at exactly the same time. Can two threads access the same data structure safely at the same time? Probably not which means that we're going to need some kind of synchronization around that shared ready queue, which means that the CPUs are going to have to wait for each other before they can get their next threads. Now, for four cores, yeah, it's not a big deal. But I'm going to digital. And I have 500,000 cores. Are you telling me that 499,999 cores now need to wait for a lock? Yeah, that doesn't work. So one of the big problems with a shared ready queue is you have contention for a shared resource. It does not scale well. One of the other interesting things that happens with the shared one shared ready queue is the fact that each time the thread runs, it may run on a different core. And the problem with that is that you get low cache affinity. What cache affinity is, is say you were running on core A and you've populated its cache with your data and then you get kicked off, wouldn't it be nice when you run again if some of the data that you had put in the cache previously was still there? Because that would give you a little extra snappy behavior. There were some things you didn't have to get from RAM. That's cache affinity. How much stuff was left behind from the last time you ran? Well, with one shared ready queue, there's the possibility that you run on a different core every single time. So your chances for cache affinity are really, really small. 
So while that is an option, it's not a scalable option. It's not a really great idea. I'm sure all West 161 does it. It's pretty dumb, right? <laughs> all right. Now, this other approach. If I have one ready to per core, then I don't have to worry about shared resources. Because each core <coughs> has its own private ready pool. So when it is ready for its next thread, it just grabs one. It doesn't have to wait for 500,000 of the cores to access it. It has private access to its very own ready queue. So that's great. No, no contention for a shared resource, which means it's going to scale really well. We also get the added benefit of cache affinity. Because if you are running on core one, you're always going to run on core one. Because when you get preempted, you're going to go to the back of the line, whether it's the multi-level feedback or whatever it is, you go to the back of the line on the queue for that course. So you will always run on that course. So you get great cache affinity. But it's not perfect. There's a problem with this too. The problem with the per core ready queue is the fact that, well, wait a minute. If I have one hour of time, and all of these jobs here should be considered equal, then on core four, that one job gets a full hour of computation, whereas these two middle cores, those jobs get 15 minutes or less each. What we have is a load balancing problem. There are some cores which have significantly more jobs and more work to do than other cores. And when multi-core systems actually first came out, this is some behavior I observed in Windows. Uh, Windows didn't really know how to make use of all of the cores that you had available. It's a lot better at it now, but it never used to be. And so you would open up the task manager, and you've got you know, your four little windows to show you what is the utilization of each of your cores. And what you used to see was of those four cores, one of them is sitting at 100%, and the other three are sitting there doing absolutely nothing. That's a load balancing problem. What we, what's the point of having those three extra cores if you're not using them? Use them. And so what we need to do is we need some way of redistributing the load. Unfortunately, in order to redistribute the load, we're going to have to reduce our cash affinity. So there are many strategies we can do. When a new thread appears or a thread gets preempted, we can choose which queue it goes onto the back of, which say, who's got the fewest jobs, I'll give it to you. Or we could periodically take all the jobs in the system and redistribute them evenly. There are many, many different strategies you can use, but regardless of the strategy you use, you're going to be shifting execution of a thread from one core to another, which means you're going to reduce your cache rate. Windows is a lot better at this now, by the way. I, uh, I actually, I have a Windows machine somewhere at home. And I opened it up and I looked at the task manager and sure enough, it was using all of the cores. And I was like, wow, that's amazing. Uh, now, is it always that great? So my new research machine has 32 cores. Yeah, it's not too good at balancing across that. But four and eight seems really, really reasonable. What was that? All right, that's all there is to scheduling. There's four minutes left. I'm not starting a new topic. Pretend it's Friday. Enjoy your rankings or jobs that got canceled after Matt.